Caroline, I'm the managing director of FUS, and um, uh, I will be the moderator of, of the upcoming panel discussion. And in order to kick that off, uh, I would like to invite Achim back on stage um, to discuss with us. And also welcome as a, a, a new, or well, wherever you like. <laughs> and also welcome uh, Lisa Paus. Um, I will uh, introduce Lisa briefly. Uh, Lisa is um, a member of the German Parliament, member of the Green Party. She's a financial uh, a spokesperson for financial policies um, of uh, her um, fraction in the in the parliament. Uh, she focuses a lot on tax fraud, um, tax evasion, money laundering uh, practices and how to avoid it. Um, uh, also on tax justice and, and of course also uh, she's putting quite some thoughts on the um, basic structures that we also need in the finance system in Germany and how to develop that further and since we hope expect <laughs> that uh, the Green Party will be part of the future government. We have a very interesting setup here. Uh, Mariana, I'm not sure how familiar you are with German politics, so we have, have Achim as one of the major economic advisors to the German government. Lisa as a potential part of the future government slash governing party and yourself as our let's say outside council here so <laughs> let's um uh, let's let's call it like that uh, but not compare it with with mckinsey or anything um <laughs> and <laughs> we would like to spend uh, uh, the next uh, uh, minutes discussing with this uh, with the three of you um about how uh, we could, uh, which of your ideas uh, we could implement here in Germany, which are more likely, which are more ambitious, um, how to do that, where are the major challenges? Achim gave us a little insight in the beginning on German mindset <laughs> with a good comment about uh, irony and joking. So, um, but I think there are some deeper psychological truth to this. So <laughs> I think also your thoughts, Mariana, on how to build a new relationship between um, uh, bureaucratic and uh, and business actors, etc. All that comes back to 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 certain, let's say, cultural specificities in Germany. So, um, yeah, that's why. Let, uh, let's kick it off. I will also take a seat. <clears throat> and I would like to open the stage, uh, Lisa, since you are new in our round with you. <laughs> Very welcome again. Hello. And. Um, Maybe you can just give us uh, your thinking. Uh, you are also, we are aware that you cannot comment on it in, de on, in detail, but you are part of the ongoing coalition negotiations. Um, what is your perspective first from your green backgrounds on the, on the thoughts of Mariana, um, uh, especially regarding um, changing structures uh, in, in creating markets, in uh, directionality for politics, which is a very big, bold stand, I think. Um, and uh, how much, from a pragmatic point of view, how much chance or hope do you see uh, for realization of those ideas? Well, I really have to thank you personally for your books, especially for your book on entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial state, uh, because um, um, actually I did not read so much uh, of your books, but uh, all the theorists you just mentioned were also my godfathers and godmothers, mm -hmm. well, godfathers most of all, um, because I am also an economist. I did study in the early uh, end, uh, end of 80s, early 90s, uh, and uh, I did all this thinking about market, state, you know, all these debates. Then, of course, I switched uh, profession and uh, went into politics uh, and had all still this, um, this dichotomy between market and state and all the old debates you already mentioned. Um, and I tried, um, I, I became member of the Green Party to change at least one party in their mindset uh, of the idea with market and state, because of course we know as Greens for the transformation you need the state. You can't just focus on markets, markets can play an important role in that, but uh, not that the markets are able to produce good outcomes uh, needs the state to, to form the market and of course you need the cooperation between state and market to, to do so. And um, so this really was something uh, that was very important, I always believed, for my party. But I truly must say, in, in my early years, I wasn't that successful. 
um, mm. I had these ideas of innovation and you know, your, what your uh, now um, um, school is, but uh, I just, one person wasn't that successful. But then your book came mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, in my party, of course, uh, like in every party, you also have groups. In my party, uh, in the green group, you have uh, the, the so-called uh, 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 realistic um, group and you have the, the left group. Oh, sorry, she can't hear me. Oh, uh, she can. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, uh, and I, I belong to the to the left group uh, within my party, and uh, and the others they thought they are more um, capable of knowing how economic policy uh, has to be, and. Uh, the, the book of Mariana Mazzucato really made the turning point because it became kind of a Bible also to the to the yeah. other group within the Greens. And so we were able to talk together about the new function of state and how to do the transformation. Yeah. So thank you very much from my heart <laughs> to this book and the others you did. You did really a good a great work uh, directly to practice policy within uh, Germany because you influenced very much uh, my party on these issues. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And we did it kind of, you said Keynes uh, always wanted us to do that. You made the theory and now we do the practice and now we'll see uh, how this uh, again uh, 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 helps one another uh, by maybe you following what we do in Germany and we still following what you, what are your new theoretic thoughts about that implementing the new empir empirical um, um, evidence. Um, well, we have our program. We are now in uh, debates uh, with the, the two other parties, uh, the Social Democrats and the, then the, the, the Liberals uh, within Germany. And um, of course, uh, we as Greens go in these uh, talks with our program. And that means, uh, first of all, of course, an, a very important role of the state in this transformation. Also, uh, in, at least in, in um, well, in, at least in two ways. Uh, one, of course, do new regulation you know, for, for, for the markets, but also the state as an active and uh, innovative player within this. And that means for us that we need a big uh, investment program for transformation in climate and digitalization. We did our campaign with uh, the idea that we need at least uh, 50, 50 billion, yes, uh, 50 billion plus investments uh, per year in Germany. That means in, the, in a 10 years term of uh, 500 a billion uh, euros uh, uh, plus. And you also mentioned the next generation fund of the uh, European level. Uh, we think that has to be not uh, not only a one-time thing, but has to uh, to, to stabilize you know, for, the, for the next uh, 10 years. So we have this big public spending program on transformation and climate and um, digitalization. And, uh, and, and by that, and uh, together with, um, um, uh, with, with new regulation, uh, we think that markets get a better impression and a better idea of where the, where the uh, future is and how markets could, should shape in that direction. And the third thing uh, within this, of course, in the market economy is that we need to internalize, internalize the external um, costs. And that means that we need a CO2 tax or CO2 price, which comes into saying the truth about the ecological costs. And this three parts uh, are the core of our um, economic and yeah, economic program. And we want to put this, of course, into a a contract in this coalition for the new German government. Thank you, Lisa, for giving us giving us and giving uh, Mariana an overview on, on where we stand. I, I think that's important. Uh, Mariana, I'm sure you have a busy schedule and I'm not sure how much you can follow each national debate, but obviously the federal elections and um, uh, the outcome especially um, has kept, captured quite some attention here in Germany in the past month. And um, it's not an, an easy situation uh, uh, that the negotiators are in. And that's why it's, uh, I think, a very good timing maybe to give some insp inspirational and encouraging <laughs> thoughts towards uh, the discussant. Um, I would also like to invite 
Ahim to give his perspective. You started doing that in your in your speech regarding um, the overall sentiment and development of thought uh, in the in the uh, in the council um, that you are that you have um, joined more or less recently. You are a member of it since uh, two years, I think. Um, so that is uh, also for your background information, Mariana. Uh, that, that that was a very big development. <laughs> we are glad that uh, a progressive thinker like Achim uh, was invited into that council, but it was also um, a very, a very new thing, let's say. And that's why um, I would be interested to hear Achim's thoughts and comments on um, how the development of discussions and also these overarching perspectives uh, that we have heard a, a lot about so far have reflected there already. Well, I think that uh, we have really witnessed uh, some some kind of modernization, really, of uh, economic thought, also uh, in in the council. Uh, and if if I if I go back to the um, earlier reports that were written, then with respect to climate change, uh, basically it was, uh, I mean, there there, there were many chapters, uh, but uh, it was basically uh, this is a problem. Climate change is a problem. The global externality. This is something that would have to be addressed globally, and that's difficult. And whatever you do nationally is always in danger, uh, endangering maybe competitiveness, uh, which is of course true. But uh, I, in in my view, it was not a very constructive approach. And I think that uh, mm -hmm. for some for for about two years. Uh, things have changed. Uh, we have a new member, by the way, uh, um, who is uh, very much interested in, in climate protection. And uh, I think we will have a chapter on climate policy every year. Uh, we we have a, had a, had a <laughs> yes. Okay, so we had a had a special report because the uh, chancellor asked us to write a report in 2019. Uh, that was, I think, quite progressive because for the first time we really addressed the question, what can Germany, what can the German government do in order to reach the German goals um, and not uh, well, shifting somehow the climate policy uh, to, the, um, to other countries. Uh, and uh, now we, we are systematically addressing industrial policy aspects and also uh, the, the international aspects and i think that so we are progressing what i think uh, if i if i look at the debate in germany i think the that the climate change is, is an absolutely pressing uh, and urgent problem i think that that's uh, well received uh, in in big parts of, of the population uh, what i think is still difficult is um that we that that we are still very much caught in in this old way of thinking economically, which makes it a matter of uh, government versus markets. Uh, I mean, in the in the election campaign, it was very much about uh, freedom versus socialism, something like that, uh, and that makes it very very difficult. And if uh, I, I agree completely with Lisa on. Uh, the, the necessity to have uh, an ambitious investment program. It's also about private investment, of, of course, but it, it, it will never work without ambitious public investment. Uh, and I think the dimension uh, you mentioned is plausible. There are many studies that, that hint to a dimension of, of something 40 to 60 billion per year. Um, and if, if you look at it, uh, I mean, macroeconomically, that's just something somewhere between one and two percent of GDP. And if you do this uh, in in small steps or in, in several steps, this can never be a, a macroeconomic problem. This can only be uh, this can be handled. That's not a difficult thing. But then there are those people who really make it a fundamental question of market versus state or government. Uh, and I mean. It, if you're talking about one one percent of GDP, uh, more or less government spending, I, I don't think that's a fundamental issue, but that's how how many people still frame the whole thing, and if we don't overcome this uh, old thinking uh, and don't get to a more pragmatic view, 
then I think that it will really be difficult. And uh, Mariana, what you are aiming at is of course much more ambitious uh, and it's, it's extremely inspiring, uh, but of course we are still far from it. And I, I think we would need many more programs uh, like the one that you are designing right now, uh, study programs that really educate the people in order to, to solve those problems. I mean, we're, having a, we're having a new master program at the University of Duisburg-Essen, a master in socioeconomics, and we are trying uh, to, to go into that direction. And I think we're quite successful, but we're still far from where we would have to go to have the, the many people to really implement all the necessary policy and innovation that, that I think we are all aiming at. So that it's, it's a huge task and uh, we don't have so much time left. So it's, uh, it's time we, uh, we hurry. <laughs> Thank you, Achim. So. So, Mariana, we are now desperately turning towards you for um, mm -hmm. um, uh, for optimism, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, and maybe for some from for some consultation in the mission economy. Uh, you argue for a course between market fundamentalism and excessively top-down planning by an overbearing state. More or less, the antagonism that Achim has described is still overly present in the uh, also in the media discussion in Germany when we talk about politics is there and we have spent the morning that uh, also to say uh, also looking left and right when it comes to social uh, transport policy so how mm. trans, how to transform the transport sector in specific uh, and, and we learned that even within Europe, there are uh, good practice examples. What are your experiences and do you know um, a, a good uh, a, a blueprint of um, how this approach worked, uh, apart, of course, from the, from the um, uh, moon, moon uh, shot uh, mission itself? Because, oh. and I <laughs> want to add that, I think... The, 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 my stomach feeling as a German is that the level of inspiration we would need to move as quickly as needed is very deeply suspect to any German. So we are not, not, the, not the selling people, not the ones who love to be told a very good story or stuff like that. So, um, and, and I think this is a, one of those uh, psychological challenges that I mentioned in the beginning. But... Um, Maybe you can just share your thoughts with us. Sure. So thanks. And uh, fascinating to hear Lisa and um, Akim's reflections. Just maybe if I can backtrack a bit and then come to your question, just reflecting also on, on where I think uh, kind of a green party and, and, and a green anything really should be thinking is that there's there's a really interesting word out there that's being used, but I think sometimes it's being used in a lazy way. And I think it's, it's an opportunity to not be lazy, which is the green deal. The word deal requires a very different type of social contract. It requires a very different type, you know, assuming we can get over the, the myths about, you know, the state on one side, the private sector on the other. The next question is how to partner, how to work together for real and create those kind of symbiotic, mutualistic partnerships and, and get the partnership itself to be as ambitious in its design as what we're actually talking about in terms of, you know, whether it's climate neutral cities, whether it's getting the plastic out of the ocean, whether it's fighting for gender parity. The partnership, I don't think, has received enough attention. And one thing that I found very interesting in Germany was that only once there was a very clear kind of, you know, the end of the end, this strategy did some of the institutions like your public bank start to also partner in a different way, right? You know, when the steel sector in Germany asked for a big uh, loan, as steel is asking everywhere, in Italy, steel needs help, in the UK, it, you know, steel needs help, in the US, steel needs help. What you did in Germany was create conditionality attached. So the steel sector had to reduce its material content in order to get that public subsidy. And there's so little of that. And it, sometimes it's seen as like a, a stick, right? You know, some sort of conditionality. And the word conditionality reminds us of the Washington consensus conditionality. So I think we need a different type of word. But having really ambitious conditionalities that allow us to build back better, not just with COVID, but literally given that we need a different growth trajectory, we need new thinking about how to do this. And, and the fact that, you know, 
the French finance minister put conditions attached to the COVID recovery fund that was given to both um, Air France and Renault. They had to agree to lowering their carbon emissions in the next five years. That's very different from what the UK government did with EasyJet, which is 600 million, no strings attached, do what you want. You need you know, the public subsidy now because you're, you're hurting. So first of all, there's very different practices on the ground. There's heterogeneity in how countries or even regions within countries or sometimes cities are interacting in the space of the deal. But I think as you know, we need to elevate up the word deal, you know, the green bit, as Greta says, listen to the science. <laughs> and of course, it's not just the scientists, but we sort of know what needs to be done. It's not getting done. But the deal, there's just not enough thinking about that. Um, and by the way, it's not just public private deals that need to be more ambitious. It's also public public. So, you know, I'm advising uh, South Africa, the, the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, and they have, you know, real problems, as many countries do within their own state of corruption, et cetera. And when you have a big state-owned enterprise like ESCOM, which is a state-owned uh, energy company in South Africa, what should be the deal <laughs> between it and the treasury? How can you turn a state-owned enterprise in, into part of the solution linked to the countries at least talk about a green transition? What should be the conditions attached there? Um, you know, so whether it's conditionality from Europe to the member states with the recovery program, whether it's the conditionality linked from a minister of finance to the companies, like in that French case, or with the treasury to a state-owned enterprise, this is all about a new social contract between all these kind of money flows, guarantees, subsidies, bailouts, recovery funds. And I think we should be really ambitious on that. Second, the, you know, the green budgeting agenda has to, again, I think, be elevated even higher outside of just kind of small circles, because we, we know now, we've seen it, both with the financial crisis and now with the COVID recovery scheme, that when we need money, money is found. <laughs> it's just that it's only found too, too late. You know, during a health pandemic where thousands, millions of people are dying globally, and you know, we all of a sudden find money to pour into the system. We do the same thing, of course, when we go to war. Every time we go to war, no one ever says, oh, sorry, we don't have any tax revenue. We can't go to Iraq, Afghanistan, or you know, fight World War II or World War III. Somehow with wars, we find the money. So it's a complete myth that there's no money. <laughs> the problem is, what are we actually prioritizing? Where are we putting the money? And how can we treat our social and societal or sustainability-related problems as urgently as we treat these kind of military or, you know, health pandemics when it's just too late because we haven't been actually investing in all the, you know, health systems and, and, and uh, capacity on the ground. And so money comes in last minute out of desperation, but in some ways it's too late. So, so the green budgeting has to be both about the how, you know, how do we do outcomes-oriented budgeting, green budgeting, which is, you know, looking at these as investments in the long run, not with obsession about deficits and so on, but it's also about you know, having kind of a different theory of money creation itself. Um, and in Europe, you know, we also have to get rid of this completely false understanding of why some countries like Germany are perhaps more productive than countries like, you know, Greece, Italy, Spain, in terms of its industrial capacity. There has been much more investment in Germany and all the things that drive long run growth and long run productivity like R&D spending much higher than in Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, uh, Fraunhofer Institutes, we spent, or you spent, sorry, I say we, uh, 10 times more than the UK does on the catapult centers, and Italy doesn't even have those types of linkages um, in terms of institutions. And so, uh, you know, uh, Max Planck Institutes, vocational training, you know, the KFW, these are all different types of a decentralized network of different public institutions, which surely can be improved, the programs can be improved. They're not perfect, but that's the true kind of secret of the German success story. It's not that somehow the Germans tighten their belts more than the Southern Europeans. And so this kind of backwards thinking of deficits and debt to GDP, where many countries after the financial crisis in Europe cut their deficits because of the pressures, also from the German government in terms of the ideology of what the Southern Europeans had to do. And that ironically has only increased their debt to GDP because they weren't making those necessary investments in these long-run drivers that require both public and private. Um, 
And, you know, uh, Akim talked about industrial policy and also your question, Caroline, which is, you know, based on sectors. You talked about transport. I think a new industrial policy has to be much less about sectors that require government support to much more about what are the challenges and, again, missions that we have and how do we get every sector, every sector to transform, to innovate and to invest towards that goal. And that's precisely why we need that <laughs> type of conditionality. In my book, Mission Economy, I look at sectors like nutrition, electronics, material, software, aerospace. They were all required to get to the moon. All the different spillovers that happen, whether it's camera fo- phones, you know, baby formula, uh, uh, foil blankets, and you know, like all those things were spillovers in so many different sectors, including the health sector, because there was a clear goal, but also because it was designed by NASA to bring as many different actors in the economy together. Um, whereas if we have a transport policy that's just about transport versus a future of mobility policy that brings together like 20 different sectors to the table, you know, that's going to have a very different multiplier effect, but also very different kind of economy wide versus sectoral um, effect. And, and, and lastly, the countries that I've seen, just again, based on your question, I, I, I think it's not so much the countries, it's specific things happening in specific places. Sometimes one country will be getting a lot of things wrong, but have an interesting thing maybe happening in a city. And then we need to learn how to scale them up. So in Sweden, one thing I find so interesting is they have at a very high level, a fossil free welfare state um, uh, challenge mission. And they land it though on the very, very concrete. So school meals in Sweden have to be healthy, tasty and sustainable. And, you know, that kind of sustainability target for something as concrete and daily as school lunches means that the procurement for the school meals is, is ambitious, it's driven by innovation and sustainability targets. And then getting the children and the students involved in the schools to learn about it throughout the curriculum, to help design the school meals in terms of participatory action, especially in an era of such polarization where people you know, think policy is not for them, it's just some sort of big you know, abstract thing. I think that also requires a lot of thinking. You know, where do we see participatory budgeting, participatory mission setting, participatory thinking about also accountability? How do we know when to turn the tap off on certain things because it's just not working? And so some of the work I'm doing in Camden, which is my part of London, which uh, you can see here outside of my window, (laughs) we have a Camden Renewal Commission where we've also landed the clean growth missions inside the housing estates. Uh, So there's 10 housing estates that have been chosen here in North London and the Camden Council region, where one of the first things is to bring the the people who live in the social housing, the public housing, to the table to think about green and sustainable living together. So it's not just about retrofitting the housing estates, but it is about living together in a more sustainable way with also community-driven projects. And there's something about that kind of civic assembly uh, uh, innovation that I think we need to also be thinking about so that we don't get what's happened in Australia or in France, which is a lot of worry that the green agenda is going to be, you know, bad for jobs, bad for this, bad for that. How can we truly, instead of just lecturing, bring different voices to the table in a stakeholder governance kind of way? Both in the mission design, the participation, but also the debate. You know, if there's fear. We should talk about it. Uh, it shouldn't be, um, you know, just a kind of the grand and the you know elite, you know, thinking that that we need a green agenda. What does it mean to really uh, foster also a, a proper national debate, a local debate, a community level debate, um, so that the green agenda itself is um, is an outcome of uh, a, a discussion where the difficulty of the agenda is talked about in a, you know, in a way that just, again, brings a lot of different voices. And, and I think the fact we have, you know, Fridays for the Future, a student movement, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, all these movements in recent years is, is an opportunity to make sure that this is a real green movement and not just a green agenda, which is, you know, run by academics, business leaders and policymakers. And that itself requires empathy, you know, listening to the movements. <laughs> um, and, you know, we have Extinction Rebellion here in London, which is seen as very peripheral. But I think there's, a, there's an opportunity really right now um, 
to both have these, you know, big, bold agendas, but also to bring in a more genuine, non-tokenistic way, different voices to the table. Thank you so much, uh, Mariana, for sharing those thoughts with us. Um, I personally uh, uh, take away a very interesting frame that I didn't think of before regarding our um, research um, uh, landscape. And actually, that is something I think that many German politicians are quite proud of, and that helps us to excel um, uh, internationally. So I think that might be a good example frame. <laughs> But um, I would like to turn to, to, to Lisa and Achim for their takeaways. And um, Lisa, do you feel freshly inspired for the next round of negotiations that you need to leave us for? Yes, absolutely. I think that was kind of also the, the, the uh, final words. I don't have really anything to add. If I do have, should, well, two comments maybe. Uh, the first is, um, uh, you mentioned the first one was this contract issue. Now, of course, this is something uh, we now um, negotiate. Uh, and um, be because this is very important, if you want to do the transformation and you know, we have to speed up with the transformation, then you can't do it without this contract thing. It, it's not only the steel industry, but you know, there are some uh, industries yeah. where it's very, very heavy, with completely clear and others you also have to think about other uh, incentives and um, ways with uh, no goodies and baddies uh, to, um, to, 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 to transform the sectors so this is very high on the um, on the yeah on the, it has a very high priority um, still um, back to the uh, um, theorists um, as we do know that uh, these contracts uh, do have a lot of um, ankles and um, no? contracts can be designed bad. <laughs> no? Most of the contracts <laughs> are not um, perfectly uh, designed. So um, no? some more efforts in uh, theory in that, um, that could help also policymakers exactly especially right now we, because we really have to do this more and um, we don't have the handbooks for that right now and it would be better we had them we had these handbooks on that first thing and the th second thing is um, um, we completely agree on this uh, green um, uh, budget issue um, Achim and I already mentioned a little way and of course you know the the German tradition um the debt break and all this that we uh know are um that we do have some problems in germany uh to do some more spending and to talk about debt in a more rational way uh, so uh, i guess <laughs> that uh, during these um, coalition negotiations um uh, we talk more about the greening the budget and not so much about uh, growing the greening budget. Um, but uh, we'll see. Um, you know that we Greens did campaign for a reform of the German debt break. But you also know that we have a German constitution called Grundgesetz, uh, where the debt break right now is um, embraced. Um, and that you only can change it with a two third majority in the two houses, not only in the Bundestag, but also in the Bundesrat. And that means um, as this coalition um, doesn't have this two thirds in both chambers, no, it's kind of illusional to do this change right now. But um, I feel that the debate not only um, is rising um, in the UK and, and in other places, but also in Germany. Uh, and um, I think there is even uh, also theoretical work to do about uh, how climate risks are financial risks and what this really means for future public budgets. No? Uh, if you have a kind of conservative, no? good form uh, public budget and then the, uh, the climate catastrophes no? come in a um, more often pace, no, not all, not every 50 years, not every 10 years, but maybe no, every three years. That of course is a big burden and big um, risks on on the public um, public um, budgets. But still, as far as I know, at least theory does not really um, have um, new results on that issue. Or is there anything 
already in place in the economic um, in the economic field that could help me with that. So this is something I no, uh, I would like to uh, play between us again between the practitioners and the and the economists that we that we go on with these issues because we we need that and it's a really interesting theoretical thing to think about <laughs> and we really could need more theory and to in, to um, mm -hmm. in, implement it into practice thank you lisa so Arim, if you like can maybe you give us your uh, reply and also your closing thoughts um if i if i may add um regarding mariana's comments you personally are working the problem from two, thi two sides with your students and trying to send them on their way already with the new thinking, but also... I need to catch the train and Achim knows that it's not against him that I leave now and I ask him afterwards what he has said. Okay, so yeah, uh, that, that's unfortunate. You, you will be missing the solution to your problem. <laughs> Lisa, <That's>, um... Lisa. <laughs> but but uh, we have the solution on video so you can check it up anytime later. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. No, maybe okay. just um, uh, a brief comment on uh, on what you said uh, with this uh, pessimism about uh, well, some some German tray of character that prevents us from from achieving things or being innovative. I don't think that's that's useful. I, 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 actually, I don't think it exists. I mean, obviously, uh, many people in many nations are very creative and innovative, and I see lots of innovation in Germany every day. And uh, so obviously... Oh, no, no, that, that was inspiration, not innovation. <laughs> yes, but also, also inspirational. I don't, I don't think that that's that's a problem. What I would really like to stress is that I agree completely with Mariana on what she said about the, the really bad role that Germany played in the Euro crisis mm -hmm. and uh, also what you see from many countries in the periphery is not what uh, what those countries are really able to do. And I think it's a, it's a big progress that we have this recovery and resilience facility on the European level, yeah. which will really help those economies, really boost their economies and, uh, and get some things on the way. That's extremely important. And I, I, I'm, I'm very glad that we, that we have that and that this consensus has been reached on the European level. Um, but then, uh, maybe what, what's my, uh, what am I taking home? I mean, I, uh, I was expecting uh, to be impressed by uh, what Mariana would say, mm -hmm. and uh, that's exactly what happened. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, what I, what I think sometimes maybe, uh, I mean, these are really big thoughts, and these are really the big and fundamental questions. And if you if you look at at them from that point of view, it. It can also be a bit discouraging because you have to, you want to change so many things uh, all at once, and uh, there is not not much time. So if I if I uh, want to have a more optimistic view, then I think you have so many uh, uh, small inspirations for us, and there are so many small steps that we can actually take, and I think the 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 way to solve the problems is to go small steps into the right direction, make the people see and feel that it works, that it's successful, and that it doesn't hurt, and that it can even be welfare enhancing, it can be actually good for 99% for of the people, or maybe even all of the people. And if you, if you go into those, uh, if, you, if you really do those small steps, you can really create some sort of a virtuous circle, which which then really gets you uh, where, where where you want to go, uh, so that you can solve the problems. And I think that's what uh, what we what we should try, and it's it's possible. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to manage the ecological transition, uh, and it, it's it's perfectly feasible it's a, it's a question of political will and a question of uh well creating the right framework of preventing uh harm and um if if you manage that then uh we can we can do it yeah. 
Okay, Mariana, you see your optimism starts spreading. <laughs> Lisa left us some homework to do on the uh, on the thinking uh, side, I would say. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, I would like to conclude with sharing that optimism, especially uh, regarding the very specific ongoing situation in Germany. So we really hope and uh, keep fingers crossed that um, there will be an outcome that allows us to start uh, uh, the journey and to really kick off um, the transformation. It was, it already took some time to establish uh, alone the word of transformation, but now it's, I think, in almost all party programs. So uh, it's totally true. There's progress. Um, and we will keep working on it. And we are uh, looking forward to uh, further inspirations from your side, Mariana. Thank you so much for making the space for us mm -hmm. this afternoon, despite your moving. <laughs> it was a pleasure Thank to you. have you here with us. And, and just so you know, I uh, sent a message to my secretary in the office saying, did a package arrive? And she said, yes. <laughs> so it's sitting Very on my good. desk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so the supply chain didn't fail us here. I'm very relieved. <laughs> exactly. Okay, and, and, all right. And thank so you thank again you. for everything. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank everybody here in the room. We uh, wish you good sorting of your stuff, and um, we are looking forward to stay in touch. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.